It's the first session of the day. Stumbling blocks of sterilization is the uh, topic for today. We all know that the success of any operation theater lies in the success of the sterilization process. Choosing the right autoclave and choosing the right cycle to sterilize this instrument is a crucial factor for the success of any surgery. If you could see the data, around approximately 4,000 surgeries are performed for a population of 1 lakh in India. The success of all these surgeries is determined by a single factor called sterilization. Even if you have a successful surgery, if your instruments are not sterile, it leads to a lot of problems. So, in this instruction course, we are going to share to you the users involved in the sterilization process, like what autoclave you need to choose. And it is very important, however big or small a hospital is, should have a dedicated CSSD team who should have a basic knowledge about the autoclave, their working principle, the validation and the auditing because in the event of a sterilization failure, it is very important for the staff to at least identify this problem because many times we see staff calling us, sir, the sterilization indicator has failed, what should we do? We really have a thought block when you see an indicator which has failed and we really don't know how to move forward. We keep on repeating the cycle but it fails repeatedly. So today, uh, uh, myself, Dr. M. Kumaran, and a group of eminent speakers from all over country are here to share to you the different sterilization methods, the techniques, pitfalls, and what needs to be done. First, I call upon Dr. Nirmal to share his knowledge on the pros and cons of different autoclaves that are available. And if you're starting your practice, what kind of autoclaves you need to choose. Dr. Nirmal is the chairman and director of Nirmal Eye Hospital, Chennai. He's been a star as uh, a stalwart in, uh, in implementing quality standards all over India. And he was the first one to instrument to uh, bring out the ICAST standards for NABH. I call upon Dr. Nirmal to deliver his first talk. Thank you, Kumaran. So thank you, Kumaran, for this uh, opportunity. I thank AOS for allowing to have this uh, instruction course on this focused topic on sterilization. So when we, most of us, when we enter the theater, are focused on the patient and the machines we handle. But this machine, we hardly get to see, it's not just a machine. It is a promise of safety to our patients. No, no, my name is. Even though sterilization may be done behind the scenes, their impact on patient safety is significant. And you know most of the sterilization process occur outside our hospital where we don't have any control, particularly the sterilization of uh, consumables the sterilization of the implants and uh, what happens in those uh, mega institutions and manufacturing plants, we hardly get to know. Most of them use radiation-based sterilization process or hydrogen-based sterilization process and some of them use chemicals like ethylene oxide for sterilization. So what happens within our hospital is mostly thermal based on dry heat and moist heat and uh, we know autoclaving only through these two forms. So this is an overview of physical methods of sterilization. As I already said, irradiation and filtration happens outside our <coughs> workplace and uh, mostly we'll be dealing with moist heat sterilization. In those ester years, we were using dry heat sterilization, particularly in camps and mobile ophthalmic units. So we'll be focusing only on these two methods, moist heat and dry heat, and mostly about moist heat sterilization, which most of the hospitals are using now. So as the name indicates, auto means it's a self-locking device. Clave means lock. So what happens when we lock the instruments or our bundle is the major focus. It's a Greek name. Latin means uh, key, so it's a self-locking device. So it was invented in 1884 
and we are talking about this same principle and same device in various sizes and uh, few additions even after 150 years. So it has stood the test of time. So the principle is unchanged for the past 150 years and most of the <coughs> people know that the basic principle as similar that of a pressure cooker what we use in our houses. So my talk will be focused mostly on the definition, the types and how to use. So this is the principle. So water when boiled to its boiling point and when the pressure <coughs> is raised with a volume constant, steam is produced and when the closed chamber pressure rises, it kills all vegetative forms and spores in the instrument or the bundle we have loaded into the autoclave. So this is the simple principle and most of the autoclave works on this principle. So there are certain control mechanisms. So I think this video is not working. I'll just. So there are three phases of sterilization. The first phase where the pressure increases and when the pressure fluid temperature increases. So there is heating of the water and the second phase, the pressure increases within that closed chamber. So when the pressure increases, there's a lot of changes that is happening. The steam is produced and this steam gets into contact with the consumables, instruments and whatever we place in the chamber. So essentially we are dealing with three important parameters, the vacuum, pressure, temperature, given over a period of time. So why steam, why not chemical? So this is often repeated uh, question and discussion in many of the forums. So heat, steam is an efficient heat transference mechanism. So that's why we started with the steam engine and the same principle goes on even now. So steam at 100 degree contains seven times as much energy. So this is also an energy saving device. And once it heats up cells <coughs> efficiently, the living organisms like bacteria or spores are killed. So those are three important parameters. Whatever autoclave you buy, all these autoclave work on these three important parameters. And this is the most repeated uh, parameter for an autoclave. Pressure at 15 PSI, temperature 121 degree and time for 30 minutes. So before... Uh, Desiring to buy or looking into an autoclave, you have to know the parts of the autoclave. Since the principle is the same, the chamber is very, very important. So most of us buy steel chambered uh, autoclaves. So this have to be medical grade so that it doesn't rust. And you have to have a secure lock. Most of the accidents happen because of the locking mechanism fails. And you need to have a look at the heating element also. This is one element you will be changing whenever you are having a problem with heating or <coughs> when the autoclave fails and you also need to have a water reservoir. This is very, very important. A good quality water reservoir is important to maintain the temperature and pressure. You also have to look at the drainage system. The same water should not be there. You have to change the water, uh, water for good quality steam. And uh, for the vacuum based autoclave, you need to have a good vacuum system also. And then control panel has evolved over a lot, uh, period of time from manual, now it is semi-automatic and now it is fully automated. So most of our uh, staff are very comfortable with all these panels and the numbers. It also helps us to monitor the autoclave process away from our workplace. And also you need to have good safety features. So these are the types of autoclave. And most of the practices still use this pressure cooker autoclave and vertical autoclave and most of the uh, at accredited hospitals have uh, gone to horizontal autoclave and large hospitals have this automatic hospital autoclaves. So basically there are uh, various methods and depends on the products that is sterilized. The gravity method is basically is a lab type uh, autoclave used to autoclave the biohazardous waste. This is a legal requirement to autoclave the biohazardous waste. Now, glassware and unwrapped goods. This is what we are using with uh, uh, in camps or yesterday when there were only 
small instruments. Now we have the vacuum based autoclaves. This is basically very good for wrapped loads and uh, porous materials as well as tubings and cannulas. So basically we have to package the goods for sterilization. Of course, liquid method, we are not sterilizing, but some of them uh, want to sterilize everything uh, like BSS or uh, Visco. In those cases, this autoclave for water, saline and agar and uh, few chemical consumables would be useful. So let's go to the uh, main topic, the pros and cons of various autoclaves. So this is the commonest autoclave we see in many of the hospitals. So basically it is a lab autoclave and uh, one important principle is surfaces have to have direct steam contact for efficient sterilization. This is the reason NABH or any regulatory organization whenever uh, visits or inspect a hospital we look for what all you sterilize in this right if they are using to uh, sterilize the reusable cannulas or reusable tubings or vitrectomy tubings we ask them to switch over to a good quality class b autoclave it also takes prolonged time so it's not really energy efficient and uh, the, there is incomplete air elimination. There are certain pockets, particularly the lower area, since it is gravity displacement, the lower bin may not be sterilized properly and can't be used in hol hollow cannulas or tubings because it doesn't reach those uh, hollow cannulas and long tubings. And so it's also difficult to calibrate and validate the entire system. So and also leave behind residual air, that means there is a risk of compromising the important process for which we, this is used that is sterilization. So these are the pros and cons for people who are going to uh, buy or looking at this option. This is relatively low cost and easy to use. Any engineer can repair this but there is a long cycle time. It's ideal for sterilizing solid instruments, glassware and pipettes. That's the reason why it is commonly used in labs and it can cause but it can cause damage to the porous materials, particularly if you are using a silicone tube, it can damage the inner part. Right. So, can you extend the time please? Yeah. So, suitable and it's suitable for small hospitals and medium sized loads. It's not moving. So the second type of autoclave commonly used is the vacuum assisted autoclave. So here what happens is within a closed chamber, the air is removed first for efficient sterilization and uh, the pressure buildup happens after with the steam. So what happens, there are two types of autoclave in this, the B type or the positive pressure displacement autoclave. So here the machine has two parts, one is the steam generated. So where the steam generator gets heated up <coughs> and produces steam. So there is a ready-made steam for the chamber to get heated. Okay. So, and then the N-type autoclaves, uh, negative pressure displacement. Here, both the mechanism are within the same area. So both steam generated and vacuum generated in the same machine. The problem here is uh, the time delay and also the wrapping thing changes. So this is the overview of classification of autoclaves. Class N, the, this doesn't use a vacuum to remove air from chamber. So this is basically meant for solid instruments. That is the reason why most of the dental units will be using this class N or class S. Class B is what we prescribe. This use it has a vacuum pump, can be used for wrapped and hollow instrument. In ophthalmology, if you are using these kind of instruments, it's better to switch over to B class autoclave. It is available in all sizes. There are uh, bench top, table top, as well as large units. And so these are the pros and cons. So class B autoclave has very good effective sterilization, almost uh, close to 100 percentage and particularly when we are using uh, for some small uh, instrument for protecting the sharpness, we can use a wrapped cycle and it's quite versatile for every fabric and porous material we can use this. Efficiency, very short cycle time. Once the chamber is heated, the second cycle time or the second load 
becomes easier within 10 to 15 minutes and lot of cycles are there. There are 12 cycles in class B autoclave. I think Dr. Rajiv or Kumaran will be covering that. And ease of usage. Now most of the class B autoclaves are automated and easy to use. We can also have a control over the way that is handled. The cons part is it's a bit expensive and uh, maintenance needs regular maintenance needs good quality water this is very very important having purified water is important and the wrapping you should not use uh, clothes most of the problem happens because it is improperly wrapped with uh, cloth so where the fiber is released and this gets clogged into the drainage area and compatibility is very very important so you have to use the common shape uh, instruments A large instrument will be difficult the third one is uh, what we are familiar with the consumables, the ETO sterilizations is ideal for materials that cannot be sterilized with heat. It is particularly a low heat uh, chamber and uh, so this can be used for commercial use also. Cost is low, but it's a long cycle time. It takes about 8 to 12 hours for smaller machines. For larger uh, machines, it takes about 8 hours and you also need to have some uh, period to vent the exposure to chemicals so you cannot use it immediately you have to leave 24 to 48 hours before you use them plasma sterilizer is the new uh, uh, autoclave so these are the pros instead of uh, ethylene oxide here they use the plasma so this uh, temperature pl uh, plasma helps to kill the microorganisms so this is a low temperature sterilization useful for all sharp equipments as well as uh, very sensitive uh, silicon equipments or uh, tubings. So, short cycle time is the important uh, advantage of this and sterilization is quite effective. At present, the cartridges are costly, but it's safe and environmentally friendly because they don't, they don't use toxic chemicals and plasma is part of our body. So, the cons part is uh, it's a bit expensive. The load capacity is very limited. You need to have either the industrial type or the smaller versions. And it also, you have to prepare the consumables for sterilization. So it takes a lot of time in preparing them. So it requires additional training for the staff to handle plasma. And regular maintenance is important. And the maintenance is quite costly. So what type of autoclave do you need? So there are, I already told you, these are the cycles we use in autoclaves. The autoclaves you buy should possess the cycle suitable for your load. So if you are going to reuse your uh, vitrectomy tubings or FACO tubings, so you need to have a post-vacuum cycle. So these are some of the questions commonly asked in our uh, uh, infection control programs, so the decision making for purchase. So what size autoclave do I need? What type of loads will I be running in my autoclave? What is the steam source? Do I have the right type of water available? How much floor space will unit? So let me answer these some of these questions. Size depends on the size of your practice, number of patients you're going to operate. And type of load, again, as I said, if you're going to do post segment surgeries and uh, reuse your vitrectomy tubings or FACO uh, tubings, you need to segregate your consumables according to accordingly decide about the loads. Steam source, ideal to separate the steam source and use a good purified water. And right type of water, again, purified water, whether RO water or uh, altered water or softened water, anything is good. So you have to use the same source of water all the time. And also ensure after three months, you check the inner linings of your tubings as well, because some mineralization can happen. Floor space, always autoclave is a heat sensitive equipment. Leave at least two floor uh, two feet space around your autoclave. It's very, very important for maintenance. Very often staff get injured or uh, <coughs> get burnt because of very closely uh, close space. So what uti utilities or support records? Very, very important that you have a rapo with the engineer and also ask his uh, suggestions. So water and energy saving technology, I think uh, Kumaran will be covering about this. How will I get the autoclave involved? So this is also important. So installation is very, very important, as important as purchasing. You need to have a proper space as well as the power backup for the machine. Tech support is essential. 
and warranty look at the warranty when you buy the machine most often it is one year but the heating element may not be given warranty beyond six months so you have to ensure that this part is looked into and also look at the replacement part most of the uh, parts may not be available if you are purchasing a uh, imported one so ensure that those parts are available cmc is important at least for the third and third to third year and beyond the first two years you can have amc so demo and staff training is very very important this one equipment we will not be handling your staff will be handling so this part is essential particularly from the manufacturer side we need a good support so where is the sterilization management this is also important because parts are difficult to get after uh, so many years and uh, ensure uh, please don't buy refurbished autoclave because of the various component used. So, decide, decision to buy autoclave is based on chamber size, the validation reports recovered, user-friendly interface, the regulatory compromise. So, purified water, I think I told uh, water is the lifeblood of any autoclave. So, you have to decide about the safe water. And also about engineering controls for the machine and administrative control like PPE for your staff, regular training and preparation for emergency like uh, heat burns or explosions. And you also need to maintain good records for your surveillance and monitoring. A lot of new trends are coming. This is basically to jack up the cost of the autoclave because basic remains the same. Automation might help for small practices and computerized control for record keeping and remote monitoring and now green autoclaves are coming that is to reduce or recycle the water consumed and also the control system for energy efficiency. So choosing an autoclave for ophthalmic ideal is to have a B class. So this is the one instrument the, that you have to look at investing on the best in <coughs> autoclave available. So investing in yourself it's the best investment you'll ever make. And for the practice, the next best investment is investing in a good autoclave. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nirmal, for the wonderful talk. Next, I call upon Dr. Rajiv uh, Sugumaran, consultant, Priyanka Eye Hospital, Kollam, who's very, uh, uh, got a lot of interest in sterilization techniques. So the first question is uh, water source. I think I've covered enough. There's a good quality water you can get in the practice. Okay. May I audible? Yeah. So, whatever good quality water you can get, the best uh, is distilled water. Right. So, we also did a cost. Autoclave. Because a lot of vendors now come in, they fix a pump to a vertical autoclave. So, does a class B autoclave always has to be horizontal? Right. So, Indians are known for all these jugats and are very uh, fond of them. So, in fact... Uh, it's, uh, they just will know There's a lot of questions about all this jugas. See, the principle is the same, right? But when you uh, add something to it, it should not compromise the principle. So when you add a vacuum, a pre-vacuum to a vertical autoclave, still it is a vertical autoclave and there is a gravity element. So which means the steam, unless it is pressurized and unless you leave that particular time, it, instead of 30 minutes, you have to leave 45 minutes for it to reach properly. And if you load, many of our staff, if you see them working, they will load the entire thing. There will not be even uh, some gap for the steam to penetrate. So this is not actually machine dependent, it is also process and people dependent. So that is where automation helps and let, uh, where the different cycles help. So it's always you have to uh, check how they work and how they load and how they pack these equipments. The distilled water which is available uh, commercially, they have uh, different grades. Yeah. So sometimes it's very difficult to find out the which grade of the distilled water has to be used because the distilled water we are, the people are using in batteries also. So they are, have so, so many impurities. And usually the distilled water plants which is uh, distilled water plants available, uh, they are not uh, fulfilling the, sub, the requirement. So we have to buy from the outsourcing. And uh, we are not able to judge the which quality of the distilled water is better for the autoclave purpose. Can you? Oh, okay. So, distilled water is available as industrial purpose yes. and non industrial purpose. So, there are distilled water plants specifically for healthcare units used in critical units like ICU and uh, operation theatres and dialysis. And uh, we can uh, use distilled water machines as per our requirement. So that's why load calculation and your scope of service is very, very important. 
So when you install the machine, you have to have a good engineer with you to calculate all these things. Accordingly, install a good distilled water machine. So instead of buying, because in, when you are buying, you always have a suspicion whether impurities are there or sterility is compromised. And, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Kuhlman was asked about changing the water machine. Yeah. You, no, uh, no, ideal is every cycle. No, that's what. So, that comes to your WhatsApp group uh, uh, title. Actually, ID normally we top up. Yeah. When, when it goes down, we just top it up. Ideal is See? to <coughs> change every cycle. Yeah. So, so that is the that manufacturer can... recommendation. Practically, our people don't change. Right? They use for the same thing. And uh, I, at least I ensure that they change every day. Every cycle, yeah. Yes. Now, what I do is to teach my staff, the drained water, I filter it. So, there is always so much uh, fibers and all these impurities on that. Once they see, they will change the water. So, before we go on to the next topic, uh, the main point I want to highlight is the autoclaving is, is done by our staff. So, it is the duty of every hospital to ensure the physical parameters in the autoclave room uh, to be maintained because their welfare and their safety is also important. Thank you. So, over to you, Dr. Rajiv. Yeah. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. And we have eminent people like uh, Dr. Nirmal, Dr. Kalpana, and uh, Dr. Gagan here along with me to, uh, to talk on this topic. Uh, this topic, what is given to me is how do I decide the cycle and program of my load in autoclave? It's a very, very, very theoretical topic. It's very difficult. About 12 cycles are there in uh, autoclave, in uh, class B autoclave. But uh, knowing that is not going to really help. So I'm going to be very practical in my talk. So the uh, materials use as a role in this cycle. So whatever bra material we use for uh, uh, wrapping types of packing material in steam autoclave, we can use paper, plastic, cloth or fabric, paper, plastic, peel pack and the wrapped perforated cassette. This wrapped perforated cassette is the, the latest trend and it is the best way to do it. I'll show you what it is. Dry heat, we are not using in ophthalmology. We'll skip that. And chemical vapor like ETO can be used. Wrapped perforated cassettes are the best for that. And paper, paper plastic peel packets are the best. Coming to the fabric, we have the woven and the non-woven materials. The woven material as the uh, often it is tensile. Tensile is a form of regenerated cellulose. It's, it's made from pulp. It is it can withstand the autoclave very well and it is reusable, nice material. Then is the cotton or the cotton polyester and woven in plain twill or the atlas weave. Atlas weave is the best. This is the regular weave. And this is what is called the atlas weave so that the steam can penetrate very well. The, that is nothing but skipping of one lane. That is called the atlas. The non-oven material are of three types, the spun bound, the heat bound and the melt blown. So what we do, I'll go into the detail. Whatever the no thing is, the special microbial barrier should be there, good tear resistant and tensile abra uh, abrasion resistant and dust barrier properties. These are the properties we need in non-oven material. So this is one commercially available material called the Tyvek, which is it feels like paper, but it's not paper. Feels like fabric, but not a fabric. Distinct look and feel, lightweight, flexible, water resistant, yet breathable. Breathable is what we need for autoclave or any form of uh, sterilization. And it is printable. You can put your label uh, all those things on that and the most important it is recyclable you can recycle the material so environment friendly this is the material it is commercially available I am I've got no interest in that but uh, I wanted to tell you the material ETO also unique ability to penetrate uh, packing and plastic without damaging them that's the property of this ETO so what are the materials that can be used is put it up in a table steam 
except uh, uh, low density polypropylene all other material can be used in formalin we can use all but we are not using formalin anymore in ophthalmology practice et also you can use but in plasma only the high density polypropylene can be used paper cloth cannot be used so this is the best thing to pack perforated trade thermoform trays and how do you do it you just pack it carefully without damaging it and before you close you put the autoclave indicator within it preferably if class 5 or class 6 then put it in pouch like this and seal it this is the easiest way and the best way in ophthalmic practice then seal it and use it and the type of wrapping is also very important I'll, I'll go through the ty different types of ra wrapping methods this is the parcel method wherein you fold in a square pattern with a leading edge so that you get that leading edge to hold when you open it up this is meant for the staff to start the theater the first person to uh, start the theater they use this method so you can see this when you're opening it you're holding the leading edge alone you're not contaminating the inner surface and you set up the table like this and start the theater this is the envelope method wherein you introduce a sterilized uh, tray or an instrument to the surgical site this is called the envelope method so here again you have a leading edge for you to hold when you open it up this is the envelope method of packing So when you open it, you can hold it like this and still open it up without contaminating the inner part of the sterilized part and then introduce to the surgical site. This is the envelope method. Now we, are, we have moved to disposable gowns, but still in uh, government hospitals, we are still using the, these type of gowns, the uh, cloth uh, material. Then there is a best way of folding it so that the steam penetration will be very good as well as contamination will be minimal this you can just follow the uh, video the back portion of the gown is folded inwards it's very self-explanatory you can see how it is being folded arm is get, kept in front of it the entire thing is folded into half and this again is folded into three and three now the the, the center part is lifted made a w like fashion and what ultimately is the shoulder part of the gown comes in top on either side. This allows the penetration of the steam very well because it's in layers, it's not rolled up, it's not tightly packed, it's loosely packed also. The advantage is when you remove it from the autoclave, when you open up, just all what you have to do is just lift it, put your hand inside like that and it opens up like that okay so this technique is good even for ETO as well as steam sterilization you can even the disposable gowns can be re-sterilized with this method and this is what I was talking about the wrapper perforated trade this is a reusable material it is available now it's not come in western countries it's freely available now in indian market it has started coming and i think they are one company called my healthscape they have introduced this recently this is the best see for one set one case one set you, that pack should contain everything for one case so that there is no cross contamination between two cases so packing of material in bin 
maybe linen you can do you should never pack it up tight like this he was going on telling and the staff will do you have a little space there actually it should not be done like this this is what i wanted to do. when you're doing it give enough space for the steam and preferably in one direction so that this steam penetration and your process is correct this is the best way of packing it now he, dr nirmal dealt with this uh, different cycles gravity cycle vacuum and the liquid uh, gravity is due to the lightness of the uh, steam it pushes the uh, air out of the chamber and goes out vacuum you use a pump and remove it a liquid cycle is when you are using liquid For those days we used to autoclave uh, ringer lactate and all if you the word liquid says it doesn't say that you introduce a liquid or anything you decompress it very slowly or pump in air into the chamber so that the pressure is maintained and so the bottle does not burst that is what is called the liquid cycle now this is gravity whatever you say you show a graphic like this you will understand what is gravity and this is vacuum cycle you have a dedicated pump pull the air out of it and then introduce the steam that is vacuum and that is the earlier one is the gravity okay now there are different phases in uh, autoclave the first phase is pre conditioning the vacuum the air is removed and then heating up coming up phase two, in two minutes more and phase 3 is the kill time and the exhaust time determining the cycle is important what cycle you need determine the cycle type then determine the cycle parameter time and temperature there is a formula for it and validate the cycle there are what you validate is with 10 uh, biological indicators put together and no biological uh, no while ample should uh, come positive that is the ultimate so if you look at the ophthalmology and the unsterile load is it liquid or not we are not using liquid no so air has to be removed because we have a lot of tubing so if air removal is needed then you go to the pre vacuum so what we need is the pre vacuum cycle so eto this, these are the parameters to be followed and the shelf life what is important in this is the it, it depends on when, uh, what trap or material you use, storage condition, the condition during transport and the amount of handling. So if you properly packed uh, double uh, packing, then you can even store it up to one, one year. There is no fixed time in that. We'll discuss it in the last discussion. Storage time. Thank you. Dr. Kalpana Suresh, who is a consultant, Kalpana Eye Care in Chennai. So we have got your uh, uh, the autoclave and you have packed it. The next is, suppose you have a sterilization failure, what do you do? So before she sets up her slides, a few questions to Dr. Rajiv. So nowadays we see a lot of people still using uh, the stainless steel bins for uh, the sterilization process. So do you have any comments on that? Is it really advisable to use a sterilization bin? And the other thing is that uh, do not mix your different kinds of instruments in a bin. See, I've seen a lot of people uh, packing linen and instruments in the, inside a single bin. And sometimes they add their liquids also into it, so the RL or BSS. So this is not a good practice. The bin, if you're using, should be only for linen and not for your instruments. And if you're putting your instruments in a bin, it has to be only instruments and they should be placed unpacked. So this is the take home message if you're going to use a bin. Otherwise, the best way is to have, uh, like what Sir showed, separate uh, uh, yes, containers where you have your instruments for every set. Uh, that is the best options. Over to Dr. Kalpana, madam. Yeah. So I'll be talking on sterilization failure. I have no financial interest to disclose. So I think somebody will be talking on the indicators. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I'll be doing that next. So it's just a brief uh, uh, thing about indicators. The class one is external or process indicator. So as uh, you would have seen the uh, nice videos showed by uh, Dr. Uh, Rajiv. The every uh, packing there is an external tape that is external or process indicator. They indicate that the packages have been exposed to that particular physical conditions of the sterilizer. That means it has been processed by that steam. It doesn't ensure that the enclosed items have become sterile. So it's just the process is complete. That's all it indicates, and uh, it's never uh, it's not enough if you just have class one indicator. Okay, so when class one indicator fails, it doesn't change the color. The tape remains the same. So what you have to do is uh, that means the sterilizer has not reached that particular temperature set point, and the steam is not enough. So check the power source. Check any leak from the steam generator. Chamber drain might be blocked. You have to physically look into it, and it can prevent the air from escaping the chamber and steam from reaching that particular. Pressure and temperature, and uh, wrong temperature entry if it's a manual one or a semi-automated one. Class two indicator. It is uh, uh, typical prototype is Bovidic type. It's used for specific test. It ensures that the air is inside the chamber is drained completely. It should be the first step of the day and to be done each day to ensure complete air removal from the Uh, vacuum type that is class B sterilizer. So inadequate air removal can cause inadequate steam penetration and uh, interfere with the sterilization process. So this is how it looks. Unused test and test is not passed till some yellow uh, 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 stains will be there and test is passed means that completely there will be color change and the color change should be even. So look at the uh, if the Bovidic uh, test fails, look for any air leak. Look at the gasket of the uh, chamber. Run a vacuum leak test. Check the steam valves. There might be condensation in the steam jacket that can lead to uh, cold spots. Check the integrity of the steam valves. You have to physically inspect all these uh, elements. Check the expiry date and storage conditions of the pack. And you have to run a five-minute uh, sterilization cycle. In fully automatic, it is pre-programmed, but in uh, others, you have to run a five-minute sterilization cycle prior to placing the Bovidic test. If no warm-up cycle is uh, done, this will be negative. Incorrect procedure: ensure empty chamber and proper temperature. So next is class five uh, in indicator integrator. This reacts to all critical variables in the autoclave that like uh, correct temperature, pressure, time, everything. So it should be used within uh, each sterilizer and each tray uh, in the uh, sterilizer. Whatever you keep in the sterilizer, and if it fails, that means the pack is very unsterile. Uh, packaging errors can be a cause. So peel pouches, as it was uh, demonstrated earlier, should not be dumped. It should uh, there should not be two peel pouches uh, within one uh, one. Okay, you should not put two uh, packs for a single instrument. So it should be single. It should be stacked in a, a container or a tray. It should not be haphazardly tightly packed. And uh, textile packs, the wrapping material, as it was uh, mentioned. It should not be too dense. It should be porous for the steam to enter. So size of the pack should be adi uh, adequate, not uh, oversized uh, than the autoclave chamber. Using artificial lin linen, which are non-porous, very thick, and the steam will not be able to penetrate them. So use a recommended packing material: cotton, porous, appropriate size, and stacked properly. So loading as. Uh, You, you should not dump everything into a single uh, bin or a, uh, the, uh, a single uh, cycle. Stacking the packs, overload, tight packaging uh, means steam will not penetrate in between the packs and it can impair with the uh, sterility. Peel pouches not placed in one direction 
these are the loading errors so ensure that adequate space is there between the trays stack vertically in one direction or uh, if it is a horizontal autoclave uh, you can um, place the uh, uh, bundles closer to the drain and instrument uh, can be placed sideways ensure that steam penetration and flow should be there should be enough space malfunctioning malfunctioning equipment should also be tested that is incomplete air removal inadequate temperature time poor steam quality and quantity that can be due to uh, improper use of water that is untreated water or unclean water can lead to poor steam quality which can result in uh, inadequate penetration of steam so test the vacuum pumps pressure gauges sterilization cycles okay next is class 6 helix test pcd process challenging device this is used to uh, ensure that the all the hollow uh, tubings especially our faco tubings ia uh, tubings are all sterilized within so this test is tries to remove the air from inside of the hollow material and tubing and uh, it uh, shows the ability of the autoclave to penetrate steam through these hollow tubings so this test involves uh, placing a chemical test strip you can see that uh, helix device on the right hand side uh, there's a indicator placed on the one of the tip and this is placed inside the uh, chamber the steam should penetrate the test chamber and change the indicator tape at the tip if it is negative that means uh, the air inside the tubing is not sterile and can uh, uh, induce uh, or introduce infection when you use so sufficient steam time temperature should be there air pockets uh, should not be there you should uh, run those tests valve leak should be tested so look for all these elements either you can repair or if it is uh, unrepairable you can, you have to replace the autoclave so biological indicator is uh, made up of a carrier material on which bacterial spores which are very very resistant that is geobacillus sterothermophilus which are resistant to the sterilization pro- process has been applied and this carrier material is enclosed within a vial when this is exposed to the sterilization process and it is taken out and incubated under defined conditions in the growth medium there should not be growth of any uh, organisms or survival of the spores if the spores no spores survive uh, the test is is a pass if growth is de- detected uh, uh, the medium turns yellow from purple and depends upon the uh, company the test is a fail there should not be any growth after incubation usually 24 to 48 hours uh, the test becomes uh, uh, noticeable so what do you do if you have wet packs after sterilization a wet pack means a contamination issue because excess moisture can act as a pathway for microorganisms and it's a danger to use such wet packs it can be external moisture or internal moisture external is a sterilization leak insufficient steam removal by vacuum pump internal means inside the pack once you open the pack there can be uh, water droplets within the tray so that can also be due to insufficient air removal improper packing stuffing loading items were wet before packing the instruments you ensure the instruments are properly dried before packing which uh, if you pack wet instruments again it's going to be wet steam quality is also important overloading is again a cause so do not overload wrong sterilization cycle you have to ensure what uh, sterilization cycle is required for your set of instruments and improper handling mm. so don't cover the chamber drain chamber drain will be there in the front ensure that adequate uh, space is left don't uh, place any uh, bundles or inter instrument trays clo- very close to the chamber drain ensure there's plenty of space for the steam to travel and verify that correct cycle is selected with proper amount of dry time when there is component failure a wet pack in your autoclave could mean there's something physically long wrong with the autoclave itself so it includes inspection of the valves steam traps vacuum systems and chamber drains so recommendations is check all the steam traps on the autoclave 
from and uh, from the main steam line check and clean the chamber drain strainer make sure the vacuum system is functioning and pulling a deep vacuum at the end of the cycle steam supply if uh, your autoclave is fed with a house steam check the incoming lines are insulated properly and trapped and uh, there, there can be a clogging on the uh, uh, line uh, so you have to ensure proper cleaning and steam is not flowing adequately into the uh, chamber this can lead to your load becoming waterlogged from too much of a condensate so a steam trap inspection should extend beyond the sterilizer to include all the traps back to the boiler ensure that the autoclave is fed saturated steam with good quality steam with acceptable dryness and particulate levels so once you take the load out of the autoclave how do you store it if it comes straight from the out, uh, sterilizer it's often hot and it holds a little amount of moisture so don't stack the instrument uh, bundles on uh, one above the other like piles of book you ensure your adequate space is there between them to, for it to dry uh, so this will prevent uh, wet packs building up of moisture and a wet pack these are the references so thank you madam thank you. for this wonderful talk so before I take up my uh, people, uh, so what is your call on the flash sterilization process where we use 134 degrees Celsius for three to four minutes? I believe some people are still using this. Uh, can it be routinely used for uh, sterilizing ophthalmic instruments? Up the instrument so you may not have adequate set or instrument backup so those days we are directly using the hot uh, oven or uh, hot plate method but at present uh, with the efficient cycles available in, uh, with our existing machines we can use that so only thing is please do not use flash autoclave flash cycle routinely second it is quite damaging to our equipments the FACO hand pieces and the sharp instruments should not be subjected to flash repeatedly. So that spoils the equipment as well as the FACO hand piece and the cutters as well. And fourth, uh, uh, basically if it is, it has to be done within the theater. If you are going to use the instrument in that theater area, area, you have to use it within that area or you need to have a secure transport corridor for these equipment from CSST area to the usage area. Does that yes, answer your question? Takers, and if you're using a FACO probe, then flash sterilized cooling could actually be damaging to the FACO crystals. So it's only based for only emergency instruments, which gets unsterile, as sir has said. So the take home message is flash sterilization is a name has changed now. It is called immediate use steam sterilization should be only used as an emergency purpose. So the next uh, topic is validation, monitoring and verification. So all these three words go hand in hand. I'm going to look why we need to validate our, uh, our instruments, monitor and verify. So the process of sterilization involves uh, transport, cleaning, disinfection, packing these instruments, sterilizing them and transporting them back to the storage area or into the theater for use. This six step uh, process of sterilization needs a monitoring device. So what is validation? The textbook definition of validation means it's a documented procedure for obtaining, recording and interpreting the process which would yield a product with a predetermined specification. So what is a predetermined specification in medicine? It is the instrument has to be sterile. So this is the predetermined specification. And why do we need validation? Because when you look at an instrument, there is no way you can say whether it is sterile or not by looking at it. Isn't so. So the effectiveness of the process cannot be fully verified. Uh, for example, the sterilization. Hence, we need to validate the sterilized instruments to know that whether the process has been worked well. So to define it simply, validation means justifying things for what you are doing. Uh, for example, why are you keeping at 121 degrees Celsius? Why can't it be see 115 at 10 PSI or so? So this validation is what is important and this in layman's term is called validation. What is monitoring? There is multiple steps involved in the process of sterilization and checking this is called monitoring. For example, you have to check the temperature and pressure gauges. This is monitoring. And finally, we need to double check what we are doing. And this is the biological indicator. 
So validation, monitoring, and verification goes hand in hand. This only is going to prove that your sterilization cycle has really worked. And whenever you sterilize any equipment, make sure you follow the manufacturer guidelines. Read into the print which tells you how an instrument has to be packed, wrapped or unwrapped, what temperature it has to be uh, exposed to and whether it be placed inside bins or not because we're going to uh, see call for a warranty or guarantee these things are very important they ask you how you are really sterilizing these equipments so validation consists of three parts as dr nirmal told you the installation qualification when you buy an autoclave the vendor has to give you certain uh, details and uh, and certificates, the operational and the performance qualification. So installation is something called the calibration certificate. The vendor tests all the electrical and leakage of the, uh, the autoclave. The operational qualification is to check the pressure gauges, gaskets, whether they are, are functioning properly. And finally, what we are uh, de uh, dealing with is the performance qualification, which can be divided into parametric validation and biological parametric. Uh, simply means all the physical temperature which you measure and biological is the biological indicator which you're following so this is a report of how uh, a calibration certificate looks like these are the uh, operational uh, qualification the class indicators which dr kalpana madam elaborated to you the biological indicator is the only indicator which tells you that a load is sterile it contains the spores of bacillus thercotomophilus why do we use this bacteria because it has the maximum d121 value which simply means that is it, okay, it is most thermoresistant so this is a slide which i want you to look clearly for routine sterilization loads the physical parameters and class one indicator has to be stuck for all loads, whether it's a linen or instrument. If it's a linen load, you can just use a class five or a class six or a biological indicator as per your choice. But if you're using ophthalmic instruments, which has a lot of lumen in it, you have to use a biological, a class five and a bovidic dick for all your instruments. So when is a biological indicator indicated? Whenever you install an autoclave, you relocate it, there's a malfunction, there's a repair, and a sterilization failure. Along with the biological indicator, there should be three, a negative test of a biological indicator, along with a class five integrator, and all the printouts. Only when you get all these details, a autoclave can be functional. And this is what you have to do when you, as you install. The most important thing is what is highlighted in red. If you're using a non-class B autoclave, the validation has to be done in a fully loaded chamber because the air is, is not removed. But if you are using a class B autoclave, you have a vacuum pump, the validation has to be done in an empty chamber. So this point is a take home message. So this is a summary of the validation. So this is a video which tells you how the validation is done. So after you pack all these instruments, they are should be packed very evenly. And this is the class one indicator which is stuck on the outside of every tray. We use the plastic paper pouches with a medical grade sealant. The class one integrator is placed inside every tray. And they are put inside the plastic paper pouches and sealed individually. So each tray has a class one and a class five inside. Use always medical grade sealant which has a three to four inch thickness of sealant. The most important is the placement of these uh, trays. They should be oriented vertically to allow the steel to penetrate all through. The biological indicator always has two wires. One is not what a delicate doctor is a controller, and the other is all, okay, it's packed the way you pack your instruments. It is sealed, and then it is also placed vertically in exactly the same way you part of the autoclave which is usually the entry or the exit and run the autoclave cycle. You need not run the dry cycle, the sterile cycle is more than enough. It's 121 to 134. You can then put off the autoclave, take out the sterile pack and inspect that the color change in the bovine disc is uniform. If it is not uniform, it means that there has been some residual air which has hampered the sterilization process. So once this is done, you are ready to load your bins or your load into your autoclave. 
this uh, tells you the common problems we face in a failed bovidic test. The common problems would be an air leak, an unwanted condensation, a faulty pack, you might use an expired pack. There is no adequate warm-up cycle and an incorrect procedure has been done. So the bovidic test I'm repeating does, okay, is not valid for non-class B autoclaves. The class 6, otherwise known as the process challenge device, is useful for hollow ophthalmic instruments. This consists of a 1 meter long tube with a 0.1 millimeter lumen. It also so it's got a, a case on the one end. The strip has to be folded inwards, which is very important. Then it is put inside this case, which is again fixed to the 1 meter long tube. Again, remember, this should also be packed the way you pack your instruments. So if you are putting inside linen, you put it in linen. Otherwise, you also put it inside the paper plastic pouches and seal them exactly the same way you place your instruments. So they have the same demand as per your uh, ophthalmic instruments you have placed and again place them vertically. fashion. Autoclaves are using porous load and aniline load, a bowing thickness is enough. Hollow instruments and porous instrument, a helix is mandated. So after the autoclave uh, autoclaving, the first thing your assistant should do while taking out the instruments is to check on all the indicators for their color change. This is what I call as a perfect look of a class 5 integrator where the uh, the entire window has changed black in color. A lot of people ask me, what should I do when only a part of the indicator has changed? So this is the manufacturer guidelines, which clearly says that if more than 50% of your ke chemical has gone through, then you can go ahead and use the, uh, the instruments. The biological indicator, as I told you earlier, consists of two vials. One vial is kept outside and the other is processed inside the autoclave. So once the autoclave is over, this particular vial is taken out and it is processed. It comes of two vials, a broth and the bacteria. The inner glass tube is, is uh, broken, so the broth and the bacteria are mixed and they are incubated at 47 at 57 degrees Celsius for two days. Most of the time, the indicator turns negative or positive by within the uh, 12th hour itself. So this is the unprocessed vial where the color has changed to yellow whereas the processed vials there is no growth of bacteria so it still remains as violet. Once in a while you can also process these vials in a third party lab to ensure that your uh, incubator is working well. So all the documentation Dr. Gagan will be dealing in the next talk. So this video tells you the various process of how to go about handling the validation indicators. Thank you. The oculoplastic surgeon in Narayanetra, Bangalore, who is going to talk to you about how do you audit your sterilization process. Uh, thank you, Kumran, for uh, giving me opportunity this IC and thank you, IIS, for this conference. Uh, just a general thing. Let us leave this talk and let us leave anything prescription. Why do we want to document? So as you would have heard the earlier talks, we really want to see how things are before we operate because we are not running the CSSG ourselves, we are relying on others. So basically as a surgeon, when you get instruments in OT, you want to make sure that things are okay, they have been properly sterilized. So you ask, uh, you know, your sister to do a check or like you would like to see yourself the indicators have changed or something. Right, so one purpose of documentation is to get things in an order, so you document that. Second most important thing would be a medical legal reason. God forbid if there is an outbreak or if there is an issue, then you need to have all your records in order for investigating agency, which could be from the government side. So that's a medical legal requirement. And the other requirement for you would be for yourself to recall. 
so you have some suspicion you want to recall back and trace how things are working for you so a very important thing is traceability so these are the principles you record how you record i believe is left to everyone it's just a principle that okay if you have a problem so you should be able to recall an instrument from your ot back to cssd to the process to the autoclave used and also you know if you are having a multiple ot setup like for us we have seven ot's so one autoclave cycle whatever instruments have been done might be in multiple ot so you should be able to recall and trace back each and everything so as long as this is attained by the documents what you keep rest all is fine so i'll just show you some sample formats and you know these are just to give indication to do its things you could have your own formats which you are using and they are perfectly fine the problem here is that somewhere in the middle if one of these things is missing you will never be able to trace and recall so that's where the lacuna i feel would be there in some hospitals but basic record is always always kept that's i believe is the first part of training for everyone uh other thing important thing is what should be the documentation like for us when we started you know make uh, nabh process and you know sir was there so 20, uh, 2009 or 10 we felt that our documentation is not so much proper and the recall process was a weak point and nabh has a very stringent recall policy so we started modifying documents and then you know with every passing day you know like inputs you no know, do better and we want to improve ourselves in that improvement the documents go on increasing and increasing so from a phase where their documentation was probably okay but not adequate you went to a phase of over documentation and now for last 2 3 years we are actually trying to reduce the documentation so over documentation does not ensure result and as far as cssd goes my personal thing is if you your cssd staff will also change and there will be multiple staff for us if you simplify things to a fifth grade level they work you complicate things with our knowledge make them medical kind they don't work so to simplify that what we have done is we have sop which is meant step by step how a machine is to be run and you know the entire cssd process from washing cleaning storage everything is in not more than 20 points it's like one or two page stuck there so whoever is on duty has to follow from 1 2 3 4 5 you don't deviate in case they have any issue they will have to inform someone so it's a very standard point wise sop which anyone can follow do this press button very simple so earlier we had made an sop which would be a book of 30 pages not required condensed everything displayed so that sop will simply also have what indicator they are going to use when it has to be used how to use an autoclave the 20 cycles or 12 cycles we discussed very clearly mentioned autoclave machine which cycle to be used for what load we are doing so for our requirement everything is just set button anyone can run even if you go there you can read and you can follow the instructions there and the most important thing is for all the activities we have a responsibility defined so there is one person who is going to take charge for our biological indicators water culture ot cultures and he will maintain what time it was done how it was done and if he is not there he will make sure that someone else will do or it is adjusted a day here and there so with that that responsibility we don't have any issue so our initial documentation while doing all this test has been reduced and the monitoring or audit is done by the hic committee ot in charge so we have a uh doctor so everyone will keep track so when i go to ot i do check for my ot whenever our ot in charge will go they check and hic committee is always looking at the documents so the most important thing and something would be biological indicator dr kurman showed everything to you uh so for us we use both biological indicator for steam and eto they come in different color this is eto that is it so once a week we do a biological indicator and every process you know we document that biological indicator has been run in register one then it goes to lab and this is a kind of report you'll get So this is a report for our autoclave. Can I have a pointer if you have? Uh, so this is a report which we we'll get, and it's a negative report. Same what Kumran shows, and this we do for ETU and we do for autoclave. Uh, Bovidic test every day before starting autoclave, and uh, this is the maintenance. What uh, Kumran was again saying, uh, you can see the sticker here, the strip here, and this is the machine parameter. So our machine would have an automated printout here. So you'll get with. every minute what the cycle is proceeding all the temperature parameters and everything is here and it has a self leak test so you can run a self leak test and we run a bovidic once morning in this machine so we run one machine we have a backup machine but this will be our standard machine which care, you know it's huge you know for our load and these results are maintained in register so tomorrow if anyone want we have a let's say a break of end off if you want to check this register will be verified you will get entire record in this register that we have run bovidic every day before the autoclave has run so we operate all day so we run it once every day right so now this register could be anything yours so the only thing is we want to have a record that okay whenever the 
sterilization activity has taken place, the bovidic was run. It could be twice a week also based on your load or your hospital. Similarly, we do a PCD like Helix one, we have a different one. So PCD also is run in every load and then it is maintained in the register. So uh, this is our CSSG, this is only going to take this and other parameters will be mentioned. So this is where you can go back and check for each and every cycle what were the parameters and wherever your machine or ETO machine is giving a printout, please prefer printout. That record is actually good to maintain and troubleshoot. So this is our autoclave register. So in autoclave register, very important, what was the load of the day? You may run it multiple times. What are the load details? What contents were in that? Which set number, whether it was linear set one or two or three. And then you will also have your indicators. And here you can see a class five indicator. Kumran showed you a big thing. That was a different company. And then this is our autoclave register record for that cycle. And this was a load. So you can see what all like biopsy set 01 was there, probing set 01, uh, orbit set 01. So all the sets are number which set was in which load. And now these sets obviously will be stored. And when they are used in the OT register corresponding entry will be there. So when I operate a case in patient file, let's say I've done a biopsy. So my patient file will mention biopsy set 01, will have the indicator from that set in the uh, OT register, so it will be there. So I can trace back from my file, my OT register, back to autoclave register, back to CSSG. So everything will link up and usually we need numbers, you, you can use alphabets, you can use a mixture of alphabet number, whichever way it works for you. Or if you already have a system, just see it's matching. Same thing for ETO, we maintain an ETO record, what cycle and everything. But since ETO has a longer shelf life, we keep it for six months. Uh, going back usually is a little, uh, not so much required and we don't do so much of uh, ETO load. So this is how the instruments would be stored after autoclave. And this is an issue register, what I verbally told you. So every instrument which is stored here can be traced back to the load and can be traced back to which OT it was issued and which patient we have used that. So we can go forth and back and that is the purpose of documentation. If you can ensure that, that's the best documentation we can have. Same thing with ETO, where it was issued, what was issued, which patient it was used. Uh, air culture, we do once a month. We do active air sampling as well as uh, setter plate method. So setter plate, typically all corners of OT and center. So if you see here, this is the setter plate report. Now, this is for OT1 and then OT2 and OT3, so on. So you'll get this report, this first page. And a similar report we'll get for air sampling. So these are all seven OTs what we have. And you can see that all seven culture report is there, no growth. Now, all these reports, how do we maintain is that copy of report will go to OT in charge, if you see below from the lab straight away, one copy will go to OT in charge, one copy will go to HIC secretary. So that's a clinician. So immediately a copy will come in case any of the report is not telling if there's any growth, then immediate it has to be a phone call, not even a report sent to anyone. Any positive culture, they will immediately report to everyone on phone from the lab so that you can immediately take, take corrective action. Report might still come a bit late. So preliminary report, the moment they see, they raise the flag. These reports are there. All these copies are maintained at two places for us in OT as well as HIC. So there, each of all these reports periodically is there. And we always have this check there that, okay, the water culture was due, the air culture was due. Has it happened? And what is the report? For water culture, we are a little aggressive. So from our instrument wash area, we do every weekly. For the scrub area or what we use for scrubbing, is monthly and portable water anyways is three monthly. So again, a similar report, we just document from which tap it was collected and the report there that, okay, uh, the culture is sterile. So this again, we maintain in a same way. And OT culture, the swab we take monthly. Uh, many people do frequently, uh, much less than that. Uh, in fact, we always have debate. I don't know, they can update in Tamil Nadu. It is requirement to do it every fortnight. Uh, any high volume institute you might even do weekly but this is our protocol with our load once a month we take swabs and if you see again the report will have all the OT 1 to 7 and then you know uh, microscope or spotlight for my OT or you know a GA machine or all the equipment which we use inside a swab is taken from everything and this report again will come. So the take home message for okay so is that simplify the documentation because people who are going to do should be able to do repeatedly. Many a time they're just like us, like our OT notes. We always crib writing 20 times, 30 times, you know, why we are writing so much. Same thing. So if you simplify the operating process, don't keep too much at the CSSG level, it works fine. Otherwise, if we put too many parameters, the record never gets complete. And when you are going to audit, you are yourself going to say that, you know, it's 50% complete. Give it in a way, it's simple to use, record everything. 
and monitor. Monitoring is important. So for us, we do it at two, three ends, from clinical side and from the OT in charge side. Audit yourself and see if anything is getting amiss, definitely sort it out. And in audit, again, repeating it probably for the fifth time, we just check that we can come from the CSSG to the OT and also go back, which is a recall process back and forth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gagan, for this wonderful talk. And we started early and we're finishing early, but we still have 10 more uh, minutes. We are, I'll be happy to take questions. So you can speak in the mic, sir. The boarding takes daily before the starting the autoclave for daily. Is it a costly effort for the small units? You can switch it on, sir. This cost is 180 rupees and the time the cost of the, of the bovidic also. strip, you mean? No, no, the bovidic, bovidic test. Tubing. You told about the tubing for every cycle before the uh, India. Every day's first cycle is the bovidic, bovidic test of the cycle. The tube. tube one. No, the tube is the helix test. Helix test. Helix, test. helix PCD test. There's a, a process challenge device. The helix tube comes in uh, two uh, materials, one's a silicon and one's a SS, and the cost varies from brand to brand. So do we need to take sample from the sterilizer at any point of time? I have read it somewhere that we should once in a month uh, take the sample even from the sterilizer, the inner and the outer coat. Do we need to do that? No. It is basically, we don't advocate regular microbiological surveillance. Right. But if there is a endophthalmitis or a task. So it's part of the incident reporting and trying to find the root cause analysis. Mm -hmm. That time we do. Or if there is a cluster endophthalmitis, it's, it's a part of the investigation. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Thank you for a wonderful class. I have a couple of doubts actually. Uh, for the microbiological surveillance that we do monthly uh, swabs, the fungal culture that you send, the microbiology does the culture for, I mean, they do they give the report within a span of three days or is it the culture for one month? I mean, fungal, uh, when I had sent it for a swab, uh, the college, uh, the private college had suggested uh, they keep it for one month because fungus grows very slowly. But uh, the protocol says three days will be sufficient. So what do you suggest? It depends on the type of organism you are expecting. right? Generally, we do for aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Yes. And uh, <coughs> very rarely for moles. right? So if there is the initial growth, and then the micro, it's a decision of the microbiology team to see to uh, maintain for six or seven days and then report. Or if they have a doubt in the type of organism that grows, then they will wait for some more. Some more. So, or if there is a fungal uh, endophthalmitis, you have a suspicion of that, you can specifically ask for fungal growth. That they will take at least three to four weeks to report. Uh, also, one thing that I observed, uh, especially this class one indicator that the tape that we have, the amount of blackness, like the darker, it becomes very dark when it is placed in a type B autoclave and uh, it is very light blackish when it is placed in a normal pressure cooker type for the linen. So does it really matter? I mean, uh, pressure cooker should not be used. No, that uh, is, for the linen, sir, no, the mean, color doesn't matter. Right? Whether you like uh, dark black or light black, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right? What matters is that it has gone through that process. That's what. So that's okay. the reason why we uh, encourage to use uh, five, type 5 or uh, type 6 integrators. Type. So, uh, my doubt is actually uh, there's a type B autoclave for the instruments, hollow instruments. But it's a very low capacity uh, thing. So to place linen in that on a daily basis for case to case, it becomes very difficult and practically it is not possible. So, but then in the pressure cooker type, the autoclave, it's not really satisfactory. I mean, some loads are fine and some loads are not great. So any other suggestions? No, no, like if you have both class B autoclave as well as a vertical autoclave, you can use... Uh, the vertical autoclave for linen and uh, direct instruments. 
Okay. You can also change the cycle in the class B autoclave. So, class the, B. so generally that's what we do. So we keep the instrument and FACO hand pieces separately. Yes. First uh, uh, load. Second load is the uh, cloths, if at all we need. Second so most is... often we use the disposable items. Okay. Uh, sir, and the FACO hand piece is 121, right? Not the 134. You have to check your manufacturer's Manufacturing. recommendation. So, most of the manufacturer recommend the regular cycle. See, the class B autoclave, there is a constant removal of moisture from the chamber. Correct, sir. Uh, Correct. So, your uh, 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 see, class one remains black, but whereas in a pressure cooker, the water is there inside, yes. it gets washed away and, and becomes uh, more light gray. Yeah. So, that could be the probable scientific explanation. Oh. Uh, sir, one more last up. What is this active air sampling that? Dr. Gagan has suggested. I mean, we use a settle plate, but uh, active air sampling. Oh. I have a question regarding tabletop P class autoclaves and the horizontal P class autoclaves. Do they compare? How do they compare? Is it all right to use a tabletop B class? It's, the principle is the same. Yes. The, uh, the volume is less. It's only the size. Uh, yes. So in the tabletop, everything is compact. Depends on the size, say 23 liters or 40 liters or 22 liters. Depends on the size of your organization and the number of surgeries you do. Right. So, if you want that in a bigger scale, you have this long horizontal cylinder where it's based on the number of bins you can keep. You can have two bin horizontal right. autoclave or three bin. Depends on the, beyond small, four bins, yeah. it's industrial type. In a small setup, B class should do that. Tabletop B class. No, so it's not the uh, setup that matters. Number okay. of surgeries you do, exactly. a number of uh, reusable or disposable items you use, and uh, how frequently used. That is more important. Okay. So you can go ahead and use the ta tabletop oh, yes. B class. Why not? And one there more are institutions who have 10 tab uh, tabletop autoclaves and regularly oh. use it, even large volume hospitals. One more question I have. Like you are doing uh, biological indicators as well as the steam integrators, the class 5. So you start the procedure, you find this integrator is fine, it is, the, the test is successful. Then you send it to your biological indicator for incubation. It comes after 24 hours and it, the test becomes negative. How do, what do you do about it? So 100% of them or most of the time this situation does not happen. It's more of a hypothetical situation. Yeah. If your bio, a class 5 integrator has gone through, then your biological indicator will also uh, uh, as we go through. So this is what has been reported in the, in the literature and I have never faced a situation where this situation has happened. Last month they faced the situation. No, it then might be problem. the defective indicator itself because okay. the staff can damage the indicators while sticking or okay. putting into the, uh, along with a sharp instrument. So, so, most, so in that indeed. case, you have to recheck the same indicator, I mean the uh, different indicator and if it fails again, you need to contact the vendor and uh, recalibrate your cycle time. So, if the inter class 5 integrator is test is successful, you can definitely go ahead with your surgery. Yeah, definitely. So, nowadays you have a latest device where the biological indicator can be read in 10 minutes. Uh -huh. So, the lo uh, yes, it costs around 60,000 rupees. Yeah. So, it's a fluorescent uh, uh, dye uh, included inside the biological indicator. Mm -hmm. You just put this indicator into the machine, it reads it in 10 minutes. Right. Company's name is? 3M. 3M okay. has. 3M has. There is one Indian company, Medister is also uh, dealing with that. Medicis. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. I think we we'll, I will call the session an end. I thank all my co-speakers to be a part of this uh, a wonderful... So generally, that's what we do. So, we keep the instrument and FACO hand pieces separately. Yes. First uh, uh, load. Second load is the uh, cloths, if at all we need. Second so, most is... often we use the disposable items. Uh, sir, and the FACO hand piece is 121, right? Not the 134. You have to check your manufacturer's Manufacturing. recommendation. So, most of the manufacturer recommend the regular cycle.
Uh, so your uh, 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 the class one remains black, but as in a pressure cooker, the water is there inside. Yes. It gets washed away and, and becomes a uh, more light grey. Yeah. So that could be the probable scientific explanation. Oh. Uh, so one more last. Up. What is this active air sampling that Dr. Gagan has suggested? I mean, we use a settle plate, but uh, active air sampling. Oh. I have a question regarding tabletop peak glass autoclaves and the horizontal peak glass autoclaves. Do they compare? How do they compare? Is it alright to use a tabletop peak glass? It's, the principle is the same. Yes. The, uh, the volume is less. It's only the size. Uh, yes. So in the tabletop, everything is compact. Depends on the size, say 23 liters or 40 liters or 22 liters. Depends on the size of your organization and the number of surgeries you do. Right. So, if you want that in a bigger scale, you have this long horizontal cylinder where it's based on the number of bins you can keep. You can have two bin horizontal right. autoclave or three bin. Depends on the beyond small, four bins, yeah. it's industrial type. In a small setup, B class should do that. Tabletop B class. No, so it's not the uh, setup that matters. Number okay. of surgeries you do. Yeah, exactly. A number of uh, reusable or disposable items you use, and uh, how frequently used. That is more important. Okay. So you can go ahead and use the ta tabletop oh, yes. B class. Why not? And one there more are institutions who have ten tab uh, tabletop autoclaves and oh. regularly use it. Even large volume hospitals. One more question I have. Like you are doing uh, biological indicators as well as the steam integrators, the class 5. So you start the procedure, you find this integrator is fine, it is, the, the test is successful. Then you send it to your biological indicator for incubation, it comes after 24 hours and it, the test becomes negative. How do, what do you do about it? So, 100% of them or most of the time, this situation does not happen. It's more of a hypothetical situation. Yeah. If your bio, a class 5 integrator has gone through, then your biological indicator will also uh, uh, as it go through. So, this is what has been reported in the, in the literature and I have never faced a situation where this situation has happened. Last month, it faced the situation. No, it uh, then might be the defective indicator itself. Because okay. the staff can damage the indicators while sticking or okay. putting into the, uh, along with a sharp instrument. So, so most, so in that case, you have to recheck the same indicator, I mean the uh, different indicator. And if it fails again, you need to contact the vendor and uh, recalibrate your cycle time. So, if the inter class 5 integrator is test successful, you can definitely go ahead with your surgery. Yeah, definitely. So nowadays you have a latest device where the biological indicator can be read in 10 minutes. Uh -huh. So the lo uh, yes, it costs around 60,000 rupees. Yeah. So it's a fluorescent uh, a dye uh, included inside the biological indicator. Mm -hmm. You just put this indicator into the machine, it reads it in 10 minutes. Right. Company's name is? 3M. 3M okay. has. 3M has. There is one Indian company, Medister is also uh, dealing with that. Right. Medicis. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. I think we I will call the session an end. I thank all my co-speakers to be a part of